Yutaka Okamura was born on December 13, 1961, in the Fukushima Prefecture. Okamura was interested in the anime industry in some form or fashion when he was growing up. He detailed some of his early influences and aspirations in an interview with Manga Tokyo. I thought about working in the anime industry when I was in high school and before entering university. It was around that time that Mobile Suit Gundam was airing on TV. Before that, I had been drawing manga and fancied becoming a manga artist. Yoshiyuki Tomino was popular at the time and I felt myself becoming more and more interested in the anime industry. However, that initial interest wasn't enough to pull him away from a more traditional path. Okamura did really well in his math and science courses in high school. That combined with his passion for drawing led him to pursue a career in architecture. After finishing high school, he enrolled in the Department of Science and Engineering at Waseda University in Tokyo Shinjuku Ward. While studying at Waseda, Okamura joined the university's Manga Research Society. The Manga Research Society, or MRS, has been mentioned as a reason why some students decide to apply to Waseda University in the first place. The MRS conducted group manga reviews, hosted seminars, published an annual magazine, and fostered discussions between passionate students. While he obviously was interested in manga, it wasn't until his last two years at Waseda that he seriously considered entering the anime industry. At the time, he was influenced by several directors and their unique creations. I was influenced by Osamu Desukai and Hayao Miyazaki as well. Various anime directors were creating unique anime works one after another in those days, and most of them had an impact on me. In 1984, after graduating, one of his friends recommended him to Studio Madhouse, and he was offered a job there as a key animator. His first project with the studio was Lensman's Secret of the Lens, a movie based on Edward Elmer Smith's Lensman novels. After his work on Lensman, Akamura tried to gain experience in areas that weren't related to animation. Even though he was an animator, he wanted to try his hand at directing from the beginning. I was thinking about directing from the start. To be honest, I thought I would be fine if I could draw decent pictures. I was constantly going on to everyone about how I would love to make a storyboard. That's how I sowed the seed for becoming a director. It didn't take too long for him to get his wish. At the time, Madhouse was involved in several small projects, and Okamura worked on a storyboard for one of them, but he's not even sure if the anime was actually completed. While he worked on several movies and OVAs while working at Madhouse, he decided to leave and continue working as a freelance animator. As for why he left Madhouse, it may have been because of the rigid structure. When he worked there, the most important thing was following the orders of your superiors, which obviously would put limits on your ability to create. In 1988, he worked on his first project outside of Madhouse as a key animator for the film Legend of the Galactic Heroes, My Conquest is the Sea of Stars. He would build his resume as an animator on several popular films of the late 1980s and early 1990s, such as My Neighbor Totoro, Urusei Yatsura, Always My Darling, Ninja Scroll, and Ghost in the Shell. His first opportunity to serve as a director came in 1989, when he directed an episode of Yawara, a fashionable judo girl, which adapts Naoki Urasawa's Yawara manga series. Shortly after he finished his work on Yawara, Okamura decided that it was time for a change, and in 1991, he changed his name from Yutaka Akamura to Tensai Akamura. The first television project he worked on outside of Madhouse was Production IG and Aishi Productions' Blue Seed in 1994. Just one year later, in 1995, Okamura made his full directorial debut in Memories, which is a science fiction anthology film. He directed the second of three short films that made up the anthology, Stink Bomb. Interestingly enough, the portion of the film that he directed was produced by none other than Madhouse Studios. While I'm sure that he was grateful for the opportunity, Okamura wasn't actually supposed to be the director of Stink Bomb. At the time, I was working for Madhouse Studios, and Mr. Otomo came up with the Memories Project. Originally, it was Yoshiaki Kawajiri who was supposed to direct Stink Bomb, but for some reason, he was forced to refuse. Since I was there and working with him, I inherited the project, so it was a fluke. Over the next several years, Tensai Akamura will work on some of the most influential anime of the late 1990s. He's involved with episode direction, storyboards, and animation in the 1995 classic Neon Genesis Evangelion, and worked on storyboards for another classic anime in 1998, Cowboy Bebop. In 1999, he would get his next big job as the director of Metabot, and the following year, would get another job as the director of Android Key Cater, the animation. Okamura's directing, artwork, and storytelling abilities, like any other set of skills, would develop with time and practice. The thing that he focuses the most on is creating a memorable experience for the viewer. I want to create a work that sticks in the viewer's minds. That's why I intentionally leave some parts not fully explained. I want viewers to use their imaginations for detailed parts and enjoy the process. Other than that, I try ensuring that my works are easy to understand. He was able to learn a lot from his past experiences, and working with multiple teams and directors helped him to learn different ways of doing things. In an interview with Anime News Network, he explained, So in the case of Yuwara, I watched how other people in different positions worked on the job. That's how we all learned. In the case of Cowboy Bebop, there was a totally different kind of agenda, so that was difficult. You had to go through a planning process for your storyboard, but this was something that I wanted to go through. I really made it clear that I wanted to work on this job, on this particular episode, that kind of thing. In the case of Mr. Anno's Evangelion, when we were working on the storyboard with Anno, we went through quite a few feedback cycles. We might have had a lot of details incorporated into the storyboard, and we'd bring it to Mr. Anno, and he'd just go, cut this and cut that, bringing down to the bare minimum of what we made. We were just astounded that he did that at the time, but back when we worked on Cowboy Bebop, it was completely different. We added a lot of materials and details to the storyboard. 
and he always wanted us to add more. We were really having fun with it. Mr. Ana's approach on Evangelion was the total opposite. After Android Kid Cater in 2002, Okamura worked on the storyboards for both Rasafin and Full Metal Panic, where he also picked up credits as an episode director. Despite working on some of the most popular anime of the late 90s and early 2000s, Okamura's biggest opportunity as a director came in 2003 with the release of Wolf's Reign. He was the series' overall director, worked on storyboards, and helped with its episode direction. While opinions on the series itself were mixed, it was easily the most popular property that Okamura had directed up until this point. It was the third most popular anime airing in Japan at the time, and the English release sold well in North America. After Wolf's Reign, it would be a while before Okamura got the opportunity to direct again. However, that didn't stop him from adding to his already impressive resume. Between 2004 and 2006, he worked on the storyboards for Shamurai Champloo, Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex Second Gig, Victorian Romance Emma, and Oren High School Host Club, before getting the chance to direct Project Blue Earth SOS in 2006. Okamura's next directing job would present him with a brand new challenge, creating an original story. He would be working with Studio Bones in order to create a brand new series that would be released in 2007. He came up with the concept of the series while working on Wolf's Reign. The main characters in Wolf's Reign are certainly wolves, but if you look closely they are very pure, and they are real heroes. I wanted to return to characters that were not only human, but also had a more developed dark side. I wish they had flaws, bad sides. While the concept may have been born in 2003, the story's other elements and themes were influenced by what he read growing up. When I was young, I read a lot of manga, and stories about ninjas, spies, or superheroes. The one that struck me the most is a manga by Shirato Senpei, about ninjas. There were a whole bunch of techniques in history designed to help children learn the art of the ninja, and that aspect influenced me a lot. To this were added the spirit and atmosphere of the spy series that rocked my childhood, such as The Fugitive. I wanted to mix these influences. The manga that he was referring to is The Legend of Kamui. It's about a ninja in Japan's Edo period named Kamui. He decided to leave his clan, but they considered leaving to be an act of treachery and tried to hunt him down. The story follows Kamui as he travels across Japan trying to survive. He was also influenced by 1970s television dramas like An Angel with Many Scars, or Kuzudarake no Tenshi, and Manjiro of the Cold Wind, or Kogorashi Manjiro. The story's setting was not only influenced by Okamura's desire to write a spy thriller, but he also wanted to create a story that took place in modern Tokyo, which would actually be a departure from the settings of shows and movies that he usually directs. And in order to accurately capture it, they traveled all over the city to take pictures. And in order to more effectively tell each story, he decided to adopt an unusual episode structure. Instead of having each story come to an end at the end of every episode, stories would be told over the course of two episodes. Please think of it as a one hour drama spread over two episodes. If you're forced to finish one story in 30 minutes, the episode finishes before you're really able to delve into the characters, so I made it into a bi-episodic structure. There's hilarious stories and detective tales and so on, so each episode can end up being about completely different things. When it came to character art, Okamura turned to Yuji Iwahara, the series' original character designer. Previously, he had drawn this manga for a game called Kodelka, and when I read it for the first time, I was left with the impression that this person's drawings are pretty interesting. It's like manga, but the characters can be animated realistically, and I thought that they were extremely well suited for characters in an anime, so I thought that someday I'd like to work with them. After obtaining the original designs from Iwahara, Takahiro Kamori, the lead character designer, took over. His job was to take the original designs and reimagine them in a way that would be easier for the animators to draw. Retaining the original feel of the characters was the hardest part of the process, and some of the original designs had to be changed. The series' main character, Hei, seemed to fit right into the role of the mysterious thriller protagonist. His cover would be that of a Chinese transfer student, and while some may think of him as a spy, Okamura would describe him differently. Rather than a spy, he's more of an assassin. Even as a student, the bit about him being Chinese is just an official title, but what nationality or race he really is is a mystery. As for Hei as a person, I wanted it so that his exterior face is that of a nice young man of good character. Someone with that unpolished, rugged feel. The story might be containing many stories where he tricks certain people who've got a secret and are trying to escape with it, and extorts information from these people. Pulling off this look was difficult for Yuji Iwahara. He was the hardest character to draw. I needed to achieve a subtle balance. While Hei's eyes were initially smaller to make him look more harsh and cold, they eventually decided to make him more expressive. In order to achieve this, Takahiro Kamori decided to do something unusual for characters in anime, and that was to draw Hei's eyes without any highlights. This maintained Hei's cold, blank expression, while also giving him a sense of personality. And while this was unusual in anime, it was fairly common in manga, so they decided to run with it. For the series' music, he turned to a composer who he knew quite well, Yoko Kano. He'd worked with her on other large projects, like Cowboy Bebop and Wolf's Rain, and they had a good working relationship. We have good chemistry at work. As such, there is a little story about her composition. When the series came out, a lot of people thought the music didn't sound like Yoko Kano, that you couldn't find her style. You should know that it was completely voluntary on her part. The music is not as lyrical and sweeping as her previous compositions, but it comes off as more personal. It is, perhaps, because we have a good artistic understanding that she risked destroying her image in one of my productions. When Yoko Kano first started working on the soundtrack, many of the character designs and the story's plot hadn't been finalized. 
so she had to draw inspiration from other places. In comments that she made in New Type magazine, she said, This might sound rather strange, but even what the director's wearing has an influence on the music. The director seemed to give off these police detective vibes, or even that of an artist from France. Well, I can't really express it well. There wasn't a logical or analytical approach to building things out. She played it by ear and gradually build things as she went along. Rather than through logic and reason, I can vaguely form impressions of the show through talking with the director. I thought, why not try emulating the mood of vintage French films? The males would be full of masculine allure, while the females would be glamorous and very conscious of their physical body, and there'd be mellow music during the romantic scenes. That sort of feeling. She also wanted the music to convey emotions that the characters in the series wouldn't or couldn't properly express. The characters have become what they are after disconnecting themselves with certain aspects of their human side, right? So that's why I was thinking I wanted to bring out precisely those aspects through the the music, if the emotions in humanity, the bit inside themselves that they've lost, which can't be portrayed visually, could be seen through the music instead, I had a feeling that it'd make the film all the more impressive. While he was pleased with the final product, this wasn't the sort of vibe that Okamura was initially going for. I actually had requested something like folk music from the 70s, but what she produced was quite like fusion music. It was pretty awesome how, while weaving in romantic tunes and more hard beats, with more muddled sort of stuff, she managed to really expand the worldview of this anime. I think she brought out this sense of something like darkness with an element of transparency really well this time around. Coming up with a name for an anime is something that Okamura admits it's very difficult. The name that they decided on was Darker Than Black. It somehow ended up that the Kuro no Kyokusha part would be included, somehow or another. I actually wanted to have the title be codenamed BK201, but I got told it's too weak as a title, and so it instead ended up as Darker Than Black, which was the idea of Takeda-san from MBS. I actually said I don't really like having English text in a color nobody really understands, but the moment I came out with this, it turned into, oh, this is good, so I can agree with it. Even after you've come up with an interesting premise, there are still several things that you have to deal with when creating an original work as opposed to adapting an already existing story. So when you have an original work that's being adapted, everyone knows what the right direction and answer might be for the story. Even if there's a slight deviation in the adaptation, everyone can kind of see what it should be. But when it comes to original work, no one knows what the right answer might be. So during the course of production, there might be a question posed and it's wait wait wait, that might be the new direction. When we finally settle in an area where everybody feels good about the direction, then the final work might end up being something that you've already seen before. So that's the biggest challenge we face. But that wasn't the only thing that Okamura was working on. Before the release of the anime, on February 24, 2007, a manga based on the series was released. The manga starred a young woman named Kanashino, and it isn't a part of the anime's larger story. It was written by Okamura, illustrated by Nokia, and published in Katakawa Shoten's monthly Asuka magazine. It only had two volumes, and the second one was released on November 24, 2007. On April 5, 2007, Darker Than Black premiered in Japan on an MBS and TBS. It replaced Sunrise's Code Geass Lelouch of the Rebellion on the Thursday late night anime programming block. It ran for 25 episodes, with the last one airing on September 28, 2007. The series was received well, and in October, it was nominated by public vote for the 11th Annual Media Arts Festival in the Animation category. While it didn't win, it did receive a Jury Recommendation Award in the Animation Division. After it finished airing, things settled down. The next spring, on March 26, 2008, an OVA titled Beneath the Fully Bloomed Cherry Blossoms aired. But there wasn't any news of a second season. But in July, someone uploaded an alleged Bones document to upload.jp. This document detailed the studio's staff, phone numbers, addresses, and more. The eyes of curious fans tended to be focused on the more though. Because this document, which was presented in an Excel spreadsheet, also described the projects that these animators were working on. One of the lines that corresponded with Tensei Okamura was Darker 2 Jinbiju, which means preparing for Darker 2. The studio's president, Masahiko Minami, stated that an internal investigation determined that this file did not exist within the company and was the product of a third party who wanted to damage the company's reputation. When asked about whether or not there was going to be a second season of Darker Than Black, he said, It hasn't been decided yet. We are interested in doing them. As original science fiction works, they were extremely fascinating. With those kind of dramatic storylines, I feel that there's a lot we could do potentially. That might have been the end of it if it wasn't for some other things that the document revealed. The document also listed Yasuhiro Irei as the director for another season of Full Metal Alchemist, which was confirmed by Irei himself in January of 2009. This caused fans to call Masahiko's original statement into question and added validity to the original document. While fans were anxiously awaiting an announcement, the second manga in the Darker Than Black universe was in the works. Yuji Iwahara, the original character designer, was in charge this time around. The first volume of Darker Than Black, Jet Black Flower, was released on May 15, 2009 in Square Enix's Young Gangan. It ran for four volumes, with the last one being released on January 21, 2011. Then, in June 2009, fans got the news that they had been waiting for. The second season of Darker Than Black was confirmed in the 12th issue of Young Gangan. The official title of the series was revealed in the 14th issue of Young Gangan, Darker Than Black, Gemini of the Meteor. While it was still more darker than black, 
There were going to be significant differences between the two seasons. Firstly, the staff was different, notably absent from the production credits as Yoko Kano, as Yasushi Ishii would handle the music for Gemini the Meteor. The series would also be significantly shorter, only having 12 episodes instead of the original 25. Darker Than Black Gemini the Meteor aired on MBS and TBS on October 8, 2009, and it finished its run on December 24, 2009. The second season's reception was much more mixed than the first. This was due, in part, to a drastic shift in tone and atmosphere. Even Hay wasn't the same as when you last saw him. Asked for why Akamura decided to make the second season so different from the first, he said. One thing that came up was, why make something the same? Why make something similar in the continuation? Let's do something different. In the first season, there were quite a few things that could be difficult to understand, so kind of a change of tone would be good. Maybe the protagonist in the first one was a bit too much of the rough working guy. So why don't we put something like a little cute girl at the center of season two? Just something different. Another reason for this is that for audiences who got to know Darker Than Black from season two first, we wanted to make something that would make them interested in watching season one. You know, they hadn't seen season 1 anyway, so why not learn about it by watching season 2 with this new protagonist? Right after the conclusion of Gemini of the Meteor, a new OVA series started airing. The series was titled Darker Than Black Gaiden, or Darker Than Black Origins, and it consisted of four episodes that aired between January 27, 2010 and July 21, 2010. The stories take place in between the two seasons and are meant to fill in the gaps between them. Unfortunately, that's it. It's been more than 10 years, and the only news that fans have received are notices that the series' licenses have expired. But hopefully you were able to learn something new about Darker Than Black and its creator. Thank you all for watching. If you liked the video, please like the video and subscribe to be notified every time I upload. What did you think of both seasons of Darker Than Black? Let me know in the comments. Once again, thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.